Right, when the clock strikes 19.02, we're going to get started. That's doing that weird transcription thing again. Right, said 1902, we'll get started, so we will get started. OK, welcome uh, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming on with us tonight for club update number nine. Um, so the focus tonight is all around creating the environment. So as you can guess, we'll be looking at a lot of stuff around respect um, and linking into a few other areas, particularly discipline, which we'll come on to a little bit later. So on the call tonight, You've got myself, Tom Meesham, Senior Football Development Officer. Claire McCrory is joining us again, our Designated Safeguarding Officer at the County FA. I'm very pleased to have Zoe and Rob, who I will no doubt call Bobby, as we go through this presentation with us tonight from the Football Administration team. Um, their roles aren't just discipline, um, they're football administrators, so I think it's really important that we <laughs> get that nailed straight away. Um, and their roles are around preventative measures as well as the sanctioning um, of individuals, clubs, etc. Right, so what's been going on recently? Uh, we've had a couple of league coach support events. So we ran a coach support event for the Doncaster and District Junior League last week and the Sheffield and District Junior League. Um, so we had over 35 coaches attending those events last week. Again, it's just a little call to action for you as clubs. If you've got coaches, um, particularly non-qualified or your level one coaches that you believe will benefit from attending support sessions. Um, who you think might benefit uh, from attending those sessions, please do encourage them to come and please do share um, any events that come across your inbox or you see on our socials and so on to get as many coaches as we can down there. Some other bits of your legacy um, work that we've kind of captured uh, and, and put out there via some news stories as well. So we're a month on from the tournament's finish. Um, we've got one new story, which is on the link there around the work we've done with young activators. Really interesting piece of work. And I'll send the slide deck out um, like I always do. So you can click straight to that link and have a look at the work that Molly and Leon were doing. And also we had a really nice piece on Hallam Rangers, Hallam and Redmise Rangers, um, a club that did masses of work um, around getting ready for the Euros and making their club really, really I don't like using the word female friendly, but that's the little slogan that, that the FA use. A really nice piece of work that they've done. And there's a nice uh, interview with some club officials, some players, some coaches and so on. So another good one to check out. And then finally, I know Emily's not on the call. I don't think we've got anyone from Kiverton tonight, actually. But it's for me, it's really important that we do highlight the great work that the grassroots volunteer workforce such as yourselves are doing. Um, and Emily's been recognised last week um, through the nationwide Mutual Respect Award winner for July 2022 for a commitment for, to women's football for three decades uh, and, and more and more so re, uh, work around inclusion for players with disabilities, something that we've um, we've tapped into and we use Emily and Rachel over at the club to to support us with some neurodiversity training, which we covered last week and I'll speak about again later. Um, but I think it's important to recognise the great work that, that the volunteer network are, are out there doing. Right, next. So just just a reminder for these meetings, we're here because we want to try and keep you fully up to date with everything that's going on and we want to explore development areas that can empower you as clubs to be the best places that you can be for your players. And this one ties in really nicely to that because it's around that environment that we create. So what we'll be covering, Claire's going to cover um, defining a positive environment. Um, 
I'm going to look a little bit into how clubs can embed and enforce a positive environment with their club. It might be different to some of the previous meetings you've come to because we're pretty much going to come at you with two two areas that we'd like clubs to consider doing moving forward. We'd be happy, obviously, to, to hear feedback, but we'll be coming at you with a couple of ideas that we're really keen to roll out. Um, I'll reflect on the County FA Respect Initiative that you may have come across already last season. And then Rob and Zoe will be doing some stuff around updates around discipline. Um, linked to enough is enough so you may have seen on social media today um, and you should have received um, I believe if you're a listed club official an email or some communications from England football um, around enough is enough um, and this is a new campaign targeting what has been the rise in just poor behavior surrounding football pretty much since Covid we've seen quite a, a quite a lot I'm trying to get the words out here. Um, we've seen a lot more incidents of just poor respect, misconduct charges and things like that. It's been growing and growing since COVID. Um, so that campaign is now out there. Hopefully you've seen the cons and you've seen some of the social media stuff that's coming out today because it's really, really powerful. I think it is important to highlight that generally the clubs that we have coming on with us tonight, you tend to be the clubs that really take pride in your work um, and you really uh, are out there doing the right things. So I, don't, I do want to say that although we're saying enough is enough, um, it might not be as targeted to you, but I think what we can say is that every club is going to have one of those days where something flares up on a match day. We're not immune from that. And also, um, clubs such as yourself, you're, you're kind of our flag bearers. You can be the clubs that really set the standard for us within the county that we hope that other clubs look at and think, wow, we need to be like that on our match days. Our environment needs to look like that. So again, um, <laughs> don't, don't take the enough is enough personally because we're all in this together. But I think that, um, like I said, you can be our flag bearers and really set the standard for what we expect from all clubs around the environment that they create. So that's what we're going to be exploring tonight. So without further ado, I will pass over to Claire. Right. Um, yeah. Do you want to just keep control of the slides for the moment, Misha, rather than sort of getting them back and forth? Lovely. Right. OK, so creating the right environment. Um, now, what I'm interested here uh, to hear from you is what do we mean by the right environment? What do you think we mean by the right environment? And it would be great if you could just bang a couple of words in the chat just to say what is the right environment uh, for children having fun at football and to make the game go smoothly. Just any ideas anybody has, words that they can think of. I can see Alison's typing, so um, yeah, praise and encouragement, brilliant, yeah, absolutely from Zoe. Safe environment, that's an interesting concept to explore because that can cover such a, a multitude of factors as well welcoming yeah absolutely you want to be you want people to feel like they want to be at your club um and coming there i'll come to you in a minute brian when we've got a few more words in uh friendly relaxed encouraging excellent yeah this is what we want to want people to have fun yes we always want people to have fun that is absolutely what we want to have oh brian was that what you were going to say <laughs> <laughs> Take your hand down now. <laughs> Never mind. But yeah, absolutely we want fun. Ultimately, we want children to really, really enjoy playing football, don't we? So all of these things, supportive and friendly. Ah, oh, really interesting. Yeah, children understand the boundaries. So um, yeah, you know, how how can we get that across to people as well? Yeah, fantastic words. Thank you very much. Um so yeah, it's um so what what can happen? So a few more words now. What can happen if the environment isn't right what happens then if we've not got these things in place children leave the club you lose your players stay that that's you know yeah absolutely a consequence of that and um yeah it, very sadly potentially if they've had a really terrible experience they could just decide you know what football's not for me um the players get distracted uh on the pitch they've got loads of shouting on the sidelines yep very good. And then their behaviour starts to go, doesn't it? How can they have an example from adults or managers um, and be expected to exhibit different behaviours themselves? And fall out of love with football and just decide not to play anymore. Spe yeah, absolutely, Stacey. Spectators forget their own conduct. They get, some people say they get carried away and some people use this really irritating word. It's just that they're passionate. 
And it's like, no, they're not passionate. They're misbehaving. You know, it's, there's a, there, is, there is no such thing as being so passionate that you have to have really poor conduct. But we hear that word a lot, um, you know, throughout reports that we get. And then, yeah, we get incidents with players, players on players, parents on parents, sometimes other parents telling not their own children and yelling to them as well, or their own children too. Um, I remember at a cup, when I went to the Junior Cup recently, I saw, uh, as the, I think it was the under 13s who were coming off um, and heading back into the tunnel at half time. And this dad swooped round from the side and came to stand next to the tunnel, which he wasn't supposed to be there anyway. And as his lad was coming off, he was going, you need to do better. And really aggressive tone. You shouldn't be letting that happen. You should be getting. And I thought to myself, my God, how how must that have made that child feel when he went into the changing rooms? You know, that that support wasn't there for him at all. It was just being told off at half time. And then, yeah, thanks, though. Yeah, poor behaviour then becomes tolerated, doesn't it? It's like, well, yeah, we always have a problem with that club. And, you, you know, so it becomes the norm and it becomes something we start to accept. Um, so, yeah, um, this Enough is Enough campaign is helping to try and challenge that as well and get this layer of behaviour just to stand so that the standard, the norm is good behaviour rather than poor behaviour. Thank you for that. Um, there is a snowball effect. Um, if you don't deal with poor behaviour, bumbles along the bottom of that discipline threshold, then um, it it then just continues to um, to become that issue and become the expected norm. So when we create the right environment, we can do that both on the pitch, but actually there's a lot of work can go on in the background as well that clubs can do. And I'm sure, as Tom said, your clubs have already got a lot of this in place because you're our flagship clubs that attend our, our sessions. Um, but yeah, the club needs to have its vision and its ethos and that needs to be shared and everybody needs to buy into that. And you can do that at managers meetings, at, at uh, parent meetings, you know, with other messages that are sent out. Um, so it's getting that clear vision and ethos for the club that everybody understands. The leadership and example behaviour. You expect your club committee members, your chair, you know, and we have occasionally, you know, incidents where committee members are misbehaving or shouting. If, they, if that's the example that we're getting, well, the parents are going to follow that as well as the managers and the players, and then it cascades down throughout the entire club. So it's really important that the leadership sets that example. If you've got players' voices heard, if you've got a nice youth forum or a, a method of getting young people's voice into the club, then that helps to create that environment where they feel included and they feel that they can manage the conduct, not only of themselves, but other people around. Challenge the behaviour through your club processes. Make sure it's consistent challenging as well uh, to behaviour management. So every time something comes across, follow the process consistently, transparently. Everybody knows where they're at. If they misbehave, they know what the consequences will be. It's great if you can get managers to attend CPD sessions. This helps them to get this awareness around of, of new skills. Some people maybe that did a level one or a level two many, many years ago, getting keeping them upskilled um, by these CPD sessions. That, I mean, Tom's Tom's amazing CPD sessions that everybody should go to just because they're so wonderful. Um, and then there is various FA courses as well that parents can take that talks about behaviour, also talks about safeguarding. Um, and safeguarding for all is a great course for parents to take, um, as well as some other bespoke elements too that the FA send out. So that's off the pitch. But then on a match day, um, so effectively on the pitch, there are things um, there that you can do to create that environment the minute well, even before the other team starts. So you've got those respect barriers in place. Sometimes there's not much space for them, so you might have to be a bit creative and sometimes it's just cones on the ground, so they can be a bit awkward. Ideally, it would always be some form of barrier that's a little bit raised up. Welcoming the ref, introducing to both sets of team officials, this is our ref for today, then, then that helps the ref to feel more at ease as well. That creates the right environment for them to be able to, you know, to make the decisions that they need to make. Um, managers are welcoming to the away team. The body language is good. They're not turning away from them or shaking the head or going or no muttering or anything like that at all. It's just always there as a um, uh, good good body language. Players doing the handshakes before the match and after the match as well. Signage up to say we only do positive. Just keep those positive messages out there in people's sight. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of an organised, well signposted car park because I do risk assessments for our events and, and you know, sometimes 
well, when I was working at the Cups as well, at one point I thought, oh my God, this is <laughs> this could get really hairy because it was a bit chaotic. Um, but I know that the car parking can be very limited. So it's just about trying to keep that flow and that organisation, potentially having a volunteer out there, getting people in, telling them where there are parking spaces. Just helps everybody feel settled and happy when they arrive. Um, spectators of your own club set the example of the, the behaviours that will be tolerated. So if something does happen on the pitch or decisions go against you, um, you, you know, you just keep it um, uh, that you accept the fact that that's happened. And fundamentally, we're there to have help children to have fun in a safe environment. And then after the match, managers can use full time to score the match and report issues. Or they could say as well, you know, we've given them really good scores because it was brilliant and give some examples of why it was good. You know, the spectator behaviour was good or, um, you know, the referee was brilliant. And just let's keep getting the positive messages back out um, and try and get those negative ones away. Um, so that's my bit about creating that uh, environment. Interested to find out if there's anything additional to that that you maybe do yourselves already um, that we've not listed there or some other ideas that you might have. If you do, please put your hand up or put something in the chat. Have a think about it during the course of the session and maybe uh, um, speak at the end. Oh, Anna. Hi Claire, that all sounds great. I'd be interested to hear what you'd recommend to share with the children in the like little team talk before the match, because I always do that with my own children in the car. I give them a little pep talk about, um, you know, about respect, I suppose, not always using that word. I'm sure lots of parents do, but I'd be really interested what you would say um, would be, you know, the ideal to include in that little pre-match chat with the players. What a lovely question. I'm actually going to pass that to Tom because being a professional coach himself, I think, uh, you know, I'm sure that he's got really good pep talks. Um, it would be great to be able to send out some info around that, wouldn't it? And say this is an example of the things you could say. So, so Tom, on the spot, Tom. You're Thanks, on you. Claire. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I can point out a specific example of, of me doing that because what I, what I try and be is consistent and live and breathe it so that those expectations kind of just become um, they know at any point in and around football the expectations for me as a coach um, and then obviously checking and challenging behaviour immediately that that kind of goes outside the parameters of what's expected. Uh, I'm trying to think of examples that I've seen that's a tough one it might be that you kind of pick a little pick a focus area kind of each week and remind them about okay this week or a little challenge Make sure you say thank you to the referee when the game finishes in your team talk right this week. Let's make sure we all go and say thank you to the referee. That sounds simple. Um, or it might be make sure at some point during this game you say well done to an opposition player when you think they've done something good. Or it might be. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some other ones that are, don't involve the parents. Um, yeah, just little, it, and that's how I would go about it as a coach. It maybe be more challenge based. Can you try and do this today? And then what you can do afterwards is then reflect. What did you say? Or I saw you speak to that player. What did you say to them? Or well, or what did you say to the referee after? Because without them, you won't have a game. So it's important that you say thank you. Um, so I think that's maybe how I would do it as a coach. Um, Alison's got a hand up, so I'm hoping she's going to dig me out of this hole now that I've just done my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just to sort of share um, the, the things that we do as a club. So we after our training sessions are always on a Thursday evening and, uh, and we we get all the parents together at the end of the training session and we explain to them what we've been looking at, what we've been asking the children to do. And we get the children to tell them what they've learned. And then we ask parents to reinforce that and remind the children on the way to matches on a Sunday. Remember what you did in training and this is what we'll be doing. And it's just it's that constant reinforcing and that linking of the skills, because sometimes they're not interested in some of the elements of training. It's boring. All they want to do is the matches, but it just helps to link up the theory that they're learning and the little skills and, and things with the actual game itself. And then just the reminder that as long as they're trying their absolute best, the scoreline doesn't matter. Um, you know, and we'll we'll be proud of them, whatever. And and like Tom said, you know, this week we're looking for X, Y, and Z. And you know, we do little things like Chubba Chub Champion. So if someone's done that, they'll get that at the end of a, a training session. And each each of the coaches gets to choose their Chubba Chub Champion who, who gets a little lollipop and, and that just they love that. That's all they want at the, at the end of it. They they're so eager for that. So hopefully that's a little idea for you as well. That's, that's a great idea. And I think it is really um 
I, I like the bit about including the parents and the learning from the players because that is one way that when I've done coach education to support coaches is you can take a parent's attention away from the more broader game and get it focused on their child only which can help to stop the more general chirping at refs and things like that because if they've worked on dribbling and you've brought the parents into the note they're working on and they've reminded them in the car and then they're going to be looking to see are they doing the stuff that we've kind of focused on this week that is a good way to kind of take the parents attention and put put the spotlight on their own child rather more broadly so that can be quite useful as well but i do like the the chubba chub champion as well big fan of that okay just Thanks. gonna yeah, thank you, Tom. I think we're moving on to the next. Uh, yeah. Yes. So back to me. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we're going to look at two development areas that we'd like to share with you and 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 see if it's something that you'd like to buy into or something you'd like to go away and do yourselves. Um, but we want to just quickly recap on things that we think are already going well within your clubs and and broadly from our experiences of speaking to clubs and the respect program um, last year. So currently, what we think is going well is the stuff around your club policies the code of conducts and signing on processes and um, around safe recruitment. So the club policies and the signing on processes, your code of conducts that you can see in the corner of the screen and the little screenshot from the club portal that I'm hoping most of you are familiar with. All clubs are expected to have adopted the FA Respect Code of Conducts, whether you are accredited or not. If you're accredited, it's part of it. Um, but we want to kind of use this little platform now, a couple of minutes to try and share maybe how your clubs ensure that you're living and breathing those documents rather than it just being I've ticked my box in the portal and we've filed them away. What do you do within your clubs to ensure that the behaviour standards and it doesn't have to be the FA ones if you've got your own that are really pushed and lived and breathed throughout your club? Does anyone want to share? or in the chat as well. You can go straight into the chat. Alison? So, sorry, I know I've, ju I've just spoken, but this is kind yeah. of my, my little baby is, is the respect. Um, I, I'm a teacher by profession, so for me, it's, it's really important that children understand what is expected of them and that, that they have got expectations of their own behaviour as well and that we've we've got this running throughout the club. So as welfare officer, I've visited every single team. All of the children know me, they know what respect values are. We're Waverley Wanderers, so we call it the Waverley Way. So if we see any behaviour that we challenge, we actually say, well, that's not the Waverley Way. And then we teach them what they need to be doing instead. So at every meeting, we have monthly meetings and at every meeting I ask managers for a success story and a story, a challenge and how they've dealt with it. And then I, I can offer them support and guidance. But it's all the way through and that's how the chubba chub champion kind of comes in as well because we bring in and, and we instill it in the respect values that if the show in particular things like fist bumps at the end of a really difficult match is quite hard for some of the younger children to do and you know so it's just really offering that praise and that reinforcement that it's it's just in everything that we do no, I really like that. Uh, I like the fact that that's club wide as well. It's part of your club meetings. I think that's really important because it keeps it on the agenda and keeps it front and centre. Does anyone else like to share anything that they do within their clubs to, to really help embed the, the behaviours that we expect? And it's not just players, obviously, we're talking coaches and parents uh, uh, and anyone involved with the club. I'll try and tease out some more answers from you. What about your sign on processes? I've just I've spoken to one club today that have that have committed now to implementing. Love it, Stacey. Implementing um, a signing on night where they're going to get everyone uh, in a building. They're going to take the opportunity to obviously photograph the players for the portal and things like that and sort out paying subs. And the, 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 but it's also a great opportunity for you to cover the expectations um, for parents and players alike while everyone's there. No one can miss the message. Has any club got experience of delivering delivering those sign on nights like that? If, or if or Stacey's typing again, I was going to come to Stacey and see if she'd like to share around the welcome packs as well. There's a couple of people typing. Um, Tom, I've, Tom, I've come in. I've uh, well, we have a, a club day now every year, 
very similar to what they're saying about a club night. But we have a club day and uh, basically just make it like a fun day as well. I have slides and bouncy castles, etc. But like the Waverley way, we have our own DNA that we've adapted from the FA. And it's called the Wisewood way, actually, <laughs> uh, funnily enough. Uh, but we we now adapt all our codes into that. And that's sent to the parents electronically. Uh, so they get that when they sign on on club day and we do all the photographs and everything and just make sure they're aware of what's expected. No, I really like that. I like the fact that you're dis disguising is probably the wrong word, but you're disguising some serious topics by having a fun day and getting everyone there and everyone involved, but you're using that opportunity also to get some serious stuff across as well. I like the idea yeah. of that. Well, we have a we have our child wel welfare officer there for the day as well, and then she answers any queries that they might have or any questions as well. But Nick, I know Nick usually. I'm sitting in for Nick because he's in Greece, so I'll be sat having a nice beer. Uh, but Nick usually does an opening speech to each team. They're all allocated an hour's time slot, and then we're all filtered through. And they get everything from the Wisewood way to having to listen to Nick. And then when they wake up, they can go and listen to the child welfare officer. That were a joke about falling asleep when Nick speaks. But, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, we, we do it that way now. No, I, re I really like this kind of identity that, that that's the second club, the identities you're trying to create and promote. And then, and it, covers the whole club as well it's respect but there's other areas too i really like that there might be something that we need to maybe capture a little bit better at our end and and, and share with other clubs can i just ask uh, uh, and you can put it in the chat or um or unmute yourself after sign on nights or after the season starts do you have any more touch points or any more opportunities or do you do anything else to remind players, parents, coaches of the standards that you set? Or is it simply just we're going to be be really firm at the start of the year and, and hope that's enough? Is, is there any examples of any kind of touch points during the season? Just reading uh, that big one that's come in there. OK, so that's the fir first example there around even getting the kids to sign something. We do that with my team. They all sign a set of um, a set of behaviour expectations. And I, there was a bit of a disco in the changing room two or three weeks ago when they had their boots on. Uh, it's like, you know, in the school hall when the rubber grips to it and the caretaker is fuming. Um, so we had to get the old code of conduct out and remind them of their expectations. And then we got the mop buckets out and they had to clean the floor themselves, which was interesting. But that's what we use. We literally point to it. Is that your signature there? Well, come on, say no more. I like that. Office chair. OK, so Alison says that there's a once a month visit, which I really like. And again, that is. That is showing that the club has really taken this seriously that sits at club level. So that's quality and then taking the opportunity to speak to people as and when we need it. I like that. OK, I'm going to move on because I don't want you to get bored of listening to me. The other one we just want to touch on in this one again, it's open to the floor. We've covered safe recruitment before and the safeguarding side of it, the expectations that we would have. Um, where I want to focus, and it probably links that last bullet point we just said there. Once people are in post, what support are we currently offering? um new coaches across the club network in here so is there anything once you said welcome to the club you're in we're happy to have you do you have any processes in place to try and really embed the Sheffield and Hallamshire way the Wisewood way whoever whoever you are um I'd be interested to hear if any any of you've got any examples of, of those processes that you've got in place to ensure that once they're in they're on the right track and we haven't got people coming in that behaviours might not be aligned to the ones we expect. Just leave the chat for a minute, see if anyone's got any ideas around that. Tom, we yes. uh, we tend to, well, you might know John Williams. You know John Williams, uh, 
just did a mentoring for the F FA. Yes. Now working at Rotherham United. Rotherham, yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. He uh, he comes in and for our new coaches does like a because they're mainly level one, aren't they, when they first come in? So he does like a refresher and just welcomes them to the club. And we have him in about once every three months. Uh, and then he does a refresher for everyone as well. So okay, good stuff. Just try like to keep them on track. So that regular support, those those touch points to check in and, and again, I guess it's an opportunity for them to vent and, and say, I'm struggling with this or I'm having problems with that or how do I handle my parents if they're getting chirpy or loud? What can I do? So I think that's really, really valuable. And I bet those coaches feel really supported. And I'm, I'm going to guess that that's helping to retain your coach workforce because of how well they feel supported. Well, I would say so. We don't get much of a turnover. It's uh, usually pretty extreme if anybody moves on. So, uh, I like that. So, yeah. Do we, I'm just going to throw some bits out, maybe spark a debate. Do we ask for feedback from your parents about the volunteers that are involved in their team? Do we ever give the parents opportunity to feedback? And again, linking back to what we spoke about last time, do we as, as clubs, do we ever speak to the players and say, how's X doing or how's John Smith or James Smith? What do, you, what do you like about what they're doing? Is there anything we could change? Are you enjoying yourselves? Because again, you might get that raw unvetted feedback of, I like most things, but when we play in games, he gets really serious and we don't like it or she gets really serious. We don't like that or I don't like it when he shouts at me or she shouts at me. So there might be an opportunity there. Linking back to um, listening to the voice of young people to, to link that in. Alice has just put in there that there's a survey monkey parents for, uh, get that right, monkey for parents to feedback from them and their children, which is super, really good to hear. And I think that is something that we'd really push for to go and get that raw feedback um, from your members about the environment that they're in and what's being created for them. Because um, again, you might get some stuff around, I like it, but when the parents start shouting or arguing, I don't enjoy myself and, and so on. So you'll get some really, really good bits there. Um, so I like that from Alison. Um, there's a QR code on the welcome pack for feedback. Stacey, you're one step ahead of the game here. I'm a big fan of this. So I think with that, we'll move on. Um, so there are just two areas we think that there's lots of good stuff going on and some great stuff that you've shared with us there that we're eager to keep sharing out to other clubs. Um, and we just want to kind of run through a couple of ideas, development strategies that we'd be interested to implement. And it, to be honest, what I'm about to describe here just sounds like Alison. So I might just hand over to Alison, to be honest, and run us through this. But we're really keen for clubs to look into having respect champions somewhere within your club to really bang the drum uh, and really own respect. We've got secretaries, we've got chair, uh, we've got welfare officers, we've got club development officers, we've got all sorts of roles, but as yet we don't maybe have one that's currently dedicated to respect in the environment. And I would say without presuming that I think a lot of the time it's handed to the welfare officer as a, well, that fits in your in your work area when we would maybe challenge that belief and say that it's probably a little bit too much work for that one person to do. Um, so we're asking, are there people in your club that you think you can identify that could lead on respect at your club? Um, we've just said there it could link uh, to listen to the voice of young people. It could be a person. It could be a steering group. Um, but someone or a group of people at your club that can really champion respect and create the right environment. And again, it can fit and feel different as you go club to club. It might be a match day presence. So I, I, I'm going to guess there's probably at least one club in here with us that maybe have some people that wear high vis on the day, respect monitor or respect match monitor or something like that. So it could be a match day presence is almost to be there to deter poor behaviour. Or it could maybe be similar to what Anna's describing and, and a little bit above that, a little bit more strategic about how you as a club can create the right environment and make sure that behaviour is checked and challenged. So that is an area and something that we'll be looking to push and work on uh, across the course of this season. Do any of you, other than, uh, other than Alison, which we've, we've seen, do any of you as clubs have something similar already within your club? Or could it be something or would it be something you'd be interested in looking to do 
in the future. So I'll just leave that uh, 30 seconds, see if anyone's got any feedback on that in the chat or if they've got any examples of, of stuff you've done within your club. I think is somebody already basically doing this, but maybe with an unofficial title or it's their it's their pet project that they're already doing it. And can we maybe formalize this and make it a little bit more front and center? I'd be interested to hear maybe from Alison as she's kind of already down the road at this. How much of an impact is it making on the club? Do you feel? Um, that's that's obviously the most important thing we can we can encourage these roles and encourage these ideas but if they're not impacting um, then we might need to to look at that again I've only been in post for a few months and already we're noticing the difference just in the way the children are thinking and conducting themselves and 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 speaking about themselves and and the coaches have got something almost to help them because there was when I came into role there was a little bit of a almost a, a hesitance to challenge behaviour because they wanted the children to have fun. So I had to say, but they'll have more fun in a structured and safe environment where they understand their boundaries and their behaviours and a training session will be more fun than you having to kind of herd cats. And um, so since then, it, it's just had such a big impact on just the way they listen and 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 their development will will it will become much better because they're actually their training sessions will be more fruitful than being shouted not shouted at but being sort of told three times every you know to do the same thing but if they listen the first time and and that's all about respect isn't it so time will tell but hopefully it will have a positive impact awesome thank you for sharing that okay i'm going to jump on to the next Next one. Um, this was just a mock uh, job outline, but I think we've kind of covered what the role might entail, but it, it might look like this. It might be a lot more specific, but it could be an opportunity for, for someone to be there monitoring the scores, investigating any related concerns, championing any FA respect campaigns and so on. But overall, that person within your club that's going to bang the drum. Um, but I really like the kind of the, the situation that Alison described there. Number two is something we've spoken about before. Um, it's QR code, Stacey, so one step ahead of the game. We're really keen for clubs to try, if you believe you've got the capacity to buy into this as, as a means of collecting information, both positive and negative, um, and making it simple for visitors to your site, whether that's referees, players, parents, grandparents, whoever's on site, coaches, to provide you with feedback um, that you can then use to ensure that negative stuff isn't snowballing like Claire said these little niggly behaviors that are maybe not pushing into the referee's radar or into discipline are not snowballing into something that becomes a misconduct charge in two months time because we haven't checked and challenged the behaviors and on the flip of that we want to be able to reward and capture those really positive stories as well so what we're suggesting is and I'll, hopefully you've had a little look through the link that I sent out that you that you approach this with an online form which we'd be more than happy to work with you to create if you'd like or i can give you the template that you've looked at on the link from the pre-event email and ensure you've got qr codes around the site you're on even if it's not your site there'll be ways of taking them and sticking them up with blue tack or using online pdf ones that you share with the opposition so lots of different ways to get it across um, and again you could share it with your parents pre-game um, as a way of capturing feedback um, and this will allow you to spot those trends like we said and try and nip things in the bud before it starts to grow and get worse so like i said you can display them you can have specific posters for specific areas for example the change rooms might be very player specific the referee change room if there is one might be very specific to that the bits around where the parents and spectators stand might be specific to that um, and they can scan the qr code it takes them straight to a form where they can say uh, I was at this game with this team. My name is this, da, 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 and this is what I saw today. The parents' behaviour was really poor. They were swearing at the referee. The referee didn't quite hear it. I'm not sure the coaches did. No one did anything about it. Bang. And that will come straight into you. Um, you can set that up to notify you or the wider committee or a specific person. And then your process as a club can begin to address anything that's coming in. Um, so that gives you a chance to monitor, investigate, all complaints or share positive feedback with individuals 
sort teams within your club. So I'm hoping you're able to have a little look through the template that we sent out for the dog and duck that we created. And I'm interested to hear, and I know Stacey's written a few bits, kind of what are your thoughts about that? Do you think there's going to be challenges if you were to roll something out like that at your club? And if there's areas of that that you think we change that, but it might work for us if we make those tweaks or changes. So has anyone got any thoughts or feedback or if Stacey potentially may like to share? Um, if you're already doing that, how is that working for you as a club? So Stacey came to the welfare officer meeting, yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, no, it was. It was just something that you mentioned there and I thought it'd be useful just to put it at the back of the um, welcome part so that parents can feed back at any point that they want to. But also actually just listening now, I think it'd be something because obviously social media groups are, you know, they're very prevalent now within clubs. So it's something that can be shared within team groups. But also, you know, you send the pre-match information over to your opposition. Yes. It could be something that's done with that. So it's all really useful and it all sort of feeds into that gathering feedback. I mean, obviously some there are going to be some, some disgruntled, but it just allows you to sort of collate themes, doesn't it? I think you've 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 captured that perfectly. I would be really keen for you as clubs to be upfront and get that out to the opposition to say, we welcome you to our site on Sunday. Please see this form. If you see anything that you that behaviours that you don't believe meet the high expectation we set, please let us know and encourage that. And again, like Stacey said, you're going to get some absolute whopping ones coming in and you just think get in the bin you lost eight nil and we're not we're not having this complaint you will get some of them and that's a guess it's kind of your process and how you want to manage them but you'll be able to spot the real ones and you'll be able to spot trends because it'll be the under eight reds the under eight reds the under eight reds parents moaning parents moaning coach moaning you'll start to spot trends and think we can deal with that in-house right now before this gets to the county fl before this starts to have a negative impact on the players involved in that group um so on the left of this page don't get put off by the amount of steps to there that is claire's really really good and i can share this document with you if you've not seen it before process for managing complaints to your club um, I think for this one, it would be quite simple for you to simplify that um, to, to deal with any complaints or any reports that come in. Um, and it might be the approach that Alison's taken where it's on an agenda item at your monthly meetings to say we're just going to run through the feedback we've had over the last four weeks um, and that will allow you to then and check and challenge but I think it's just really important if you are going to go down this road and me and Claire be more than happy to support you is that you have a really consistent approach so that if it's the chairman's team they get a little bit more of a lighter touch than if it's someone else that can't happen so it's just about having that really really um, clear and standardized approach for how we will deal with any negative stuff and how we'll deal with any positive stuff which might be one person sifts through them any ones that we consider to be real will be discussed at the next club committee meeting where the committee will make a decision and then it might be linking back to your club rules about this person or x person or these parents they need to go on a process here that might mean re-education might mean the online respect module it might be a warning it might be missing a game that will be up to you as a club but we're really keen for you to capture this data and information to try and get your preventative measures in and for me i just think from the outside looking in if you are getting that message saying Welcome to our start on Sunday. Teas and coffees are available. This is where you'll be parking. And just we set really high standards here. If you see anything that you're not happy about, please do let us know. Um, I think that will be a really good way for you as clubs to, to show how seriously you take this. I do want to say the asterisk says this doesn't replace the serious stuff. If there's a safeguarding concern, we wouldn't want it going in via that that report and if there's something discipline wise that the referee is dealing with again that wouldn't be something to capture in there what we're looking at is that respect that environment um that type of stuff so i'm more than happy to share um and give you the template that we've used for you to change um uh, and happy to sit with you and work through um if you want to make tweaks or changes um but we'll move on because i want to get across to the next section okay so I'm going to go through this bit really quickly because I'm fairly certain you'll all be pretty clued up on this. So the County FA Respect Initiative, our little piece of work around recognising and rewarding positive behaviours as well as the other side of it as well. Um, so 
get to my notes. So the intervention stuff, we're going to recap on 21, 22, the intervention stuff. So you may or may not be aware because we may have spoken to you, but I doubt it. Um, the, last year we started our County FA Respect Initiative, which meant the leagues were feeding in scores to us month by month. Uh, and we were intervening with teams that were getting consistently low scores. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see the, the step by step garnets for that. The main aim of it was to make sure that the game in our county for especially our younger players is fun, safe and engaging. Um, so that was the rationale behind it. We wanted to be able to check and challenge negative behaviour and try and nip it in the bud before it comes across the discipline team. Uh, overall, it was really worthwhile. Um, we, it sounds weird, but we really enjoyed kind of supporting those clubs, working through those issues and, and trying to work with them to come up with solutions to make improvements. Um, and the positive side of it, which was really good for us, um, was how much engagement there was with the positive side of it. So the respect champions each month, uh, going to the professional club games uh, and so on. So it was a really well received uh, program that we're looking to run again. Uh, well, we are running again through this season so that you can see the respect process on there. I won't spend too much time on it, but the first on the first instance, it was a phone call running all the way up to the league would be in a position to say you are no longer fulfilling your fixtures, which I'm glad to say we didn't get to last year um but like i said overall we really thought it was worthwhile it was really well and positively received by clubs even the ones that were having the negative phone call we didn't really have a negative experience um supporting those clubs just gonna not definitely hear some football in the background there there we go um where was i so you may have seen we did the respect team in the month news articles and they again like we said were the most engaged with articles or news stories we had across the whole season which was really really positive because parents and clubs and teams were jumping on to see who who had won so um really really well received um the improvements we've got for next year or this year sorry we're in this season we now have a dedicated page for respect so you, you can go there to view any of the stuff around the county fa respect initiative um where our winning teams will be featured on the page. The professional match day rewards are still in there. So for those teams that are achieving 100 percent and then winning the, the, the draw or the raffle, have the opportunity to go to the professional clubs within our county. I need to clarify with Molly if it means you can go to any of the ones from reward one and go to reward two or if reward two is for winning it again, which I think would be quite unlikely with the lucky dip wheel. So I'll get that cleared up. Um, at a later date and confirm that. So the winners get the opportunity to take the whole team, a uh, really positive experience. And normally they do the pitch walk either pre-game or at half time and they get a little bit of a ripple from the people eating their bolty pies and so on. So really good experience and a really good reward to recognize the superb kind of conduct and behavior of players, which goes a long way to reinforcing those behaviors. Um, due to the success, we're now going to have the leagues nominate an outstanding team of the month based on a on a specific moment, and those teams will have the opportunity to win uh, kit locker vouchers as well. So we're glad to say that we're kind of expanding on that uh, process as well. Um, so just keep your eyes peeled, go onto the respect page, um, share that with your teams, and really try and bang the drum that that the. the that positive stuff is being recognised and rewarded from us at the county. Um, Molly's done some superb work in this area and so much so it's been nominated for a national A award as well in the FA as well. So something that we're really proud of at the county and we're going to keep doing. OK, I'm going to move on. I've stitched them up with a photo here. I just want to kind of say here before I hand over to, to Rob and Zoe, we have spent a lot of time talking about respect uh, and creating the right environment. It's time to pass over to the football administration team with brackets discipline, the, the dreaded word. Um, we've kind of we've, we've spent that time on respect and the environment. And now we've, we're going to just delve into a little bit around the consequences of if we don't check and challenge that behaviour and also link to the enough is enough because there are some more stringent sanctions in place to try and give that added weight and added flex. Um, so before I do pass over to them, I just want to say this is probably not the, the time or the moment for us to kind of delve into the stuff around clubs being fined for spectator behaviour or the severity of financial penalties or why under 18s could potentially be fined based on incidents. 
let's just use this time to kind of focus on this particular area. And if there are questions around that, we can do that away from the meeting just to keep us on check. So um, I don't know how many of you have ever met Rob or Zoe before, which is why I put the picture on from the cup final. Rob's on the left there, uh, Zoe's there to his right. I'm sh I should have cropped Rob Wharton on the left out. He's a little bit too close there. But it's always nice to put a, a face to the name. So I'll pass over to Zoe and Rob. Hello, I, I'm Zoe. I'll be doing most of the talking, but I think Rob will put in if I'm getting things wrong or kind of going off uh, off target. So we are the administration and discipline team, and I think it's important that people understand that our role is not just specifically discipline. The reason that we're on here today, um, I think, is very important. We we deal with cases and we deal with things when they get to a threshold. So where behaviour that's looking like it is a, a respect issue crosses that threshold into a discipline issue. And it's important to look at these behaviours before they get to us. We don't want to be having that conversation with you. Sometimes they're inevitable, but really we, we prefer to be avoiding these conversations. So there's some very good things that you can do. Uh, I'm aware that the enough is enough letter has gone out and that people are in receipt of it. If you if you want a copy and you've not got one, uh, just ping us an email and we can send it out so you know what we're referring to. Um, but basically, it's to kind of tackle these behaviours before they get to a discipline threshold, it's important that we kind of create a culture of expected norms and behaviours. This will stop things developing to a point where we need to get involved where behaviours have become so unruly that they're damaging and detrimental to the sport. It provides a platform of good behaviour, so good behaviour generates good behaviour. I think there's all that, there is a lot to be said for self-checking and getting people, you know, we all, we all have off days. We can pick people up from off days, we can pick individuals up from off days, we can help support that environment. If we're all having an off day or an off day becomes our expected norms, then we're going to go into things with the wrong kind of attitude. Things are going to spiral and we're going to get ourselves into all kinds of pickles. Um, it does, I think, as Tom and Claire have both um, kind of touched on, it does impact the sport, it in impacts engagement, it in impacts people's enjoyment, and we really don't want that. So there's a, there's a few things that we can do before we get to our stage. Um, now, to understand where we fit into this, anyone can report unacceptable behaviour, questionable behaviour to us. This can be managers, coaches, spectators. It can be members of the public if you're playing in a public space. So it's making sure that we create an environment where people don't look at us and go, you know, you're playing on a public field play. People can hear parents, people can hear children saying things that they shouldn't say, engaging in things that they shouldn't be engaging in. We see a lot of various behaviours um, that may meet a threshold or that could have been managed earlier. So it's kind of addressing these things before they get to us. Um, if they do get to us, there is a process and the process is outlined on the uh, slide. So basically, if we get a report, we have to investigate it. We will approach clubs for observations. We will decide if there is a, a threshold for a charge to be met. The, once a, a charge has been issued, it will be sat on by a commission or a panel and then a verdict will be passed. Now, there's very various things that we can do if it gets to the threshold of a misconduct, which is what we would deal with if respect issues go too far. Uh, they can be financial penalties, education courses, they can be football bans. So really, we want to stop these behaviours getting to a point where they do reach us. Um, so, Tom, could you just flick on to the next slide? <laughs> no yes has that worked yes that's worked um so what is the impact of ne negative behavior on the club now i have put some in some uh kind of pointers there but is there anything that anyone thinks i've missed i've obviously covered things like loss of reputation reduced engagement disciplinary sanctions financial penalties is there any, anything else that people think that I've missed or that that comes out of poor behaviours um, being allowed to grow and develop within a club? No, 
absolutely fine absolutely fine um they can, it can be very serious um i think some of the examples that we've we've touched on and that um tom has um alluded to is that the enough is enough campaign has focused on behaviors getting kind of reaching a um level last season that was completely uh, unacceptable the fa the central fa decided at this point that they wanted to to step in so as an example of how the behaviors have become um have escalated 42 percent of our cases uh, you know reported last year what were what we call e20 offenses now an e20 offense is for behaviors of um anyone generally related to your football club whether it's big players managers supporters um backroom staff and this can happen on the field of play it can happen after a fixture and it's when the it's a it's a failure to manage those participants within your club um, so it can happen on the side of a pitch between parents or parents shouting in it can be remonstrating with the referee that was responsible for 42 percent of our cases last year and it's things that can be very easily manageable i do understand that we have tricky individuals we all have tricky individuals that may need a bit more supervision than than others but if we can nip these behaviors in the bud at the beginning then maybe we won't get into this position later on um, so for example some of the steps that the fa have taken to deal with this behavior is increased financial sanctions now they have increased from last season so for youth football in particular for an e20 charge which is the bulk of the charges that we deal with we are looking at a fine of last season what was up to 200 pounds as a maximum penalty to a fine or uh, sorry 100 pounds for maximum penalty last season that has now gone up to 200 pounds for the club now that's a lot of clubs potentially facing a lot of fines for behaviors that they may be able to manage so we are suggesting things that help or assist you before you get to our stage so basically things like i think we've touched on getting a code of conduct and circulating it circulating at the point of, of signing up at the, the beginning of the season even having a mid midpoint where you circulate that so if you start to see behaviors that are unacceptable we've got something in place where you can refer people back which i know has been touched on so we can refer parents back we can refer players back and you can really try and keep your club um, in a positive managed environment where they know it's set out from the onset of what we expect we can also have good reporting practices so um whether that is a uh, links whether that is a designated person that you report to we will have something on the county fa website shortly for people who witness behaviors and they may not feel comfortable going to the club now this may be something that we is a discipline matter but it might be something that we can refer to the respect squad if it doesn't meet that threshold if people do feel that they can't report we can you know do a bit of signposting and, and help behaviors be managed in that way um somebody did touch on social media earlier on uh, it is my absolute bugbear uh, it is another forum uh, where we do get uh, behaviors reported to us of respect it can hit a misconduct threshold if people are linked to your club uh, on facebook or on a club forum um, or platform they can be reported for what they put onto onto social media media it is representative if they are linked to your club or if it is in respect of a club or another club we seemingly are having increased amounts of uh, social media reporting so that might be something that can be put in the code of conduct or as a measure of, of acceptable behaviors again this would if it's if it's say a parent unfortunately it would possibly be reflective of the club um parents are obviously not active participants they don't have an active footballing role so if they are representing the club in a capacity they could be the ones that bring a potential fine to your door if you you know if you don't manage their behaviors or you don't have that policy in place um 
does anyone have any thoughts on you know areas that they think they're particularly vulnerable with in terms of um, things that potentially link them into fines, ways that they can manage behaviours, good practice or bad practice for, you know, trying to nip these behaviours in the bud before they get to the point of they get to us and, and they've potentially gone a step too far. There's yep, a couple of hands up there. There's, oh, yep. can't you see the participants? Yeah, there's a couple of hands I, up. So yeah, yeah. If somebody think, wants to select someone, because I can't see, uh, I can't see names. Uh, who was it first? Was it Alison first? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, oh. thank you. Um, my question is really, it, it's more around a little bit of support. So we obviously we instill the respect values and everything to our parents, but when it comes to opposition spectators and clubs and things and if the behavior from from their side is challenging particularly in a match um i know we have the the forum to report it afterwards but in terms of if it gets to a point i'm thinking particularly sort of for our under 18 referees as well who we've got a duty to safeguard you know at what point can we step in and i suppose what i don't understand really is what authority we have in terms of asking people to leave if their behaviour is unacceptable and and you know sort of challenging these things to make sure that these children and the referees and everyone else is safe um because obviously people can be quite volatile and you know so really it's your recommendations of if 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 it does get to be quite a hostile environment what would you suggest right okay so that that is a good question if you are the home fixture you obviously that is your 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 facility um it, this is unfortunate but it, it's it's accurate if you are the home fixture and an incident was to take place and we didn't know who that person was linked to it would be the responsibility of the home team to have managed that set of behaviors so if if it is in within your arena then you can ask them people to, to leave. You can ask them not to be there. What I would be mindful of is one, the potential to escal escalate a situation. Um, you, if you are confronting people, um, you may potentially escalate that, that situation, especially if people are already um, quite, quite het up. Um, what we would expect is if it, if it got reported to us, which you know we would recommend, if it gets reported to us, we can then investigate that. With what happens with the investigation is if a char if a charge then comes out of that, um, obviously it's a financial penalty on the club uh, if it gets proven. Now, no club wants that. It then becomes the responsibility. Well, it should be the responsibility, but then obviously there's an increased um, burden and an expectation for the club whose parents and spectators it is to manage that behaviour out because these parents are bringing them a financial penalty and being involved with clubs yourself I'm sure you can appreciate you don't want uh, you know money is is hard enough come through come by you don't want these financial pe you know penalties being brought by parents week in week out so that's the kind of idea behind these penalties is that there is a kind of force behind to the to the club to manage them behaviours if you can put up with those behaviours you know it's not great to expose children to that we know that um but i would just be i think it's a bit of a judgment call because you don't want to put yourself in a situation where actually what you were going to report was um a bit of swearing and, and bad language on the sideline and now what we've actually got being reported is a confrontation that turned nasty um where both clubs could be equally as responsible in some ways, depending on what behaviours come out of that. Each situation is unique. We've seen things, you know, we asked them to leave. It was fine. They left, but we're still reporting this behaviour. But then you can see things where people have been asked to leave and it's taken things in a completely different direction. So I think that's got to be a judgment call on the behaviours on the day. But um, we would say try and manage that behaviour if and always report it to us because that is the purpose of this. If if them behaviours are, you know, uh, disrespectful, if they sh if they're demonstrating the wrong kind of things, if a charge comes out of that, we will then pick that up. Failing that, if it doesn't meet our threshold, 
obviously with the, the respect squad scores, they will be picked up that way. And work will be, I think we've done work with a couple of te teams last season that they weren't, they weren't hitting the threshold for misconduct. But actually, uh, I think a few visits happened on, on the back of the respect scores that, that come in. But you could see with a, a couple of these teams, maybe the behaviours, one report would come in at one level and then the week after or a couple of weeks after we'd be getting another report and the behaviours were slightly escalated because these because people get comfortable dealing if nothing gets reported people get comfortable in that environment and that's not what we want we don't want the negative behaviors to become a comfortable environment for people Very. am mm -hmm. i correct in saying that so it's only the referee that can actually choose to abandon a match um if you felt that actually the situation had become so difficult um and so you know it's, it's important to kind of allow the referee to manage the game while they can um as well because yes. that can sometimes cause it yeah true. i wouldn't walk your players off the field of play because you deem there to be an issue however there's recently been an e20 rule change if it's based in discrimination you can take your players off the field of play uh and that means if there is an aggravated breach, racism, sexism, um, homophobia, any aggravated breach, you can take your players off the field of play. However, what happens in that case is the aggravated breach case, that would be a misconduct because it's a match abandonment. What happens in that case is the discrimination case will get heard first. If the discrimination case gets proven, then the abandonment doesn't stand that will not get heard or or the 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 team that walked sorry the team that walked off the field of play will not be held accountable for the match abandonment so they will not be held accountable because they um didn't subject i mean they chose not to subject their players to an you know an aggravation however if the uh, the discrimination case gets found not proven um, then the match abandonment will get heard and the team could get sanctioned for the abandonment. So that is a slight rule change uh, and it's important to get that, that across. However, on the whole, it is a referee only that can choose to abandon a game. I think um, obviously this is quite technical. We're getting into the very technicals now, aren't we? Yes, so if there's people yeah. that require that would like more information, I think we'd, we'd need to maybe get a yeah. quick sheet or something sent out. Um, but Anna, you had your hand up as well. Do you have a, a question? I did. Um, I'm not sure. I'm a bit new to this, so sorry if everyone else knows. But I've, have I understood correctly that the opposing team are going to give a score after each match in terms of whether we've met the respect guidelines? And then how can I access that data? Because you had talked a lot about sort of monitoring any low level things, but I'm I, I'm a, obviously an idiot. I didn't know where that was. I, I don't know where to find it, but obviously I can't always be present at every match. So it would be great if I could see that. So where would I find it? I'll ask Claire because I don't know where you find uh, it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass that one to Tom. Here's the potato, Tom. Sorry, I was just trying to Google a link. So your respect, so every game, both teams have the opportunity to submit respect scores um, for each other. It's how we monitor things. Um, it goes to full time, which is the league platform. I'm 99% sure that you can view your own respect scores. Um, I just look in to try and find a link that says this is how you do it. Um, if not, we can if you want. We can, Well, actually, you need to contact your league and say, can we have our respect scores for I'm creating work for the league here? For August, but I'm sure that you can uh, see a summary of your scores. What it might not do is it might not give you this very specifics because what we I think there is some thinking that what they don't want is um, what's the word rivalries to form that you gave us bad scores last time. So wait till we play you next time. You're going to get low scores on principle. So they, they don't want the tit for tat stuff um, coming out in it. But yes. The, that it is important to highlight every game. If your coaches and managers um, can submit the scores, it helps everyone build up a picture, your league, us, um, to try and spot the trends that are developing. Um, and I believe it can be done on the Match Day app as well as via full time. So if they're using the Match Day app, they can do it on there as well. Uh, Brian, <laughs> did Brian's hand. Is it not sorry, in the whole game system then? I've just. Respect scores are not in the whole one. game. No, it's not right, in whole okay. game. It's, it's via yeah, full time, so it's just. 
I, I don't think you can see what the other teams put you right. What happens is every now and again, well, we get uh, an average score that's sent to our uh, child welfare officer and then obviously she checks them and we all get to know how well we're doing and if there's any any issues then she takes it up with us but that's that's how a, how we get them anyway uh, so it might be sent to me a very low respect yeah. store does get sent i think there was a misconception last season that the the scoring was anonymous which i don't know if it is it, it's not it is anonymous isn't it to a point however we if we get a low score we do get pinged across an email so if if there was a low score provided by somebody i would then get in touch with them to find out what it, what the nature of the low score is or the respect squad was because we have to look at it that way uh, i think there was a mis was there a misconception about that last season claire where oh, somebody somebody did think that the score I'd got in touch with somebody and they, they'd got oh, quite yeah. upset because they believed it was an anonymous score. But obviously, if, if a fixture comes in and it's very, very low, then there is a duty for it to be investigated at least. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry, just a round up. I actually don't think you can get the specifics. So what we need to do is email your league and say, can you send us our scores for X? Or if you've got worries about two or three teams, you might say, can we have our under 10 scores for the season? Because I'm hearing a few bits and you might spot a trend that way. Um, but I think my gut instinct was right. It, it doesn't allow you to view kind of who's done what, unless, like Zoe said, if there's a uh, one that's extremely low, notifications get pinged off and people get contacted. Um, but the low level stuff, the stuff that's kind of festering, you, you'll need to contact your league. The reason is full time's the league's platform and that's where the scores are collected. So we don't. We don't use full time at all. It's it's totally a league, a league platform that they work on. It just seems surprising that we've talked tonight, haven't we, about setting up our own feedback um, scoring system and, and trying to get feedback from opposition and things. But if they're actually doing that, but then I can't see it. It, it seem. I mean, I understand we don't want a retaliation. I hope that I wouldn't. Yes. I wouldn't lower myself to ever do that. But um, <laughs> it seems a shame that I couldn't see that. You know, halfway through the season, see, okay, how's it going? It seems a bit mad. I'm, yeah, I'm just going to so share that. <laughs> that's kind of part of the reasoning behind the suggestions we've got. And the other bit is that they're very, very broad. So what it won't do is it won't be like your parents were swearing or your coach nags the referee for the full game. You won't get that stuff. You'll just kind of, you'll get a bit of a, this team's got a low score and then that's a bit of work to go. Hi there, under 10s, you're getting low scores. What do you think it could be? And of course it might, we're, we're doing nothing wrong. Whereas the, the kind of the methods we've kind of suggested tonight might give you the specifics armed and ready to go and deal with those matters. But I do agree. And it's something that is fed back quite regularly around um, the respect scores are there. Not everyone knows they exist. Not everyone understands the, the implications of doing it because without them, we can't see the bigger picture. Um, so there is definitely some more work to be done there. Uh, and I'm hoping as the FA systems grow and evolve because they're moving on to, like you've seen with the club portal, it's much improved. I think there'll be more capacity to make that more specific and more useful moving forward right i'm conscious that with the questions which are great at the end i've kept you 15 minutes longer than i should do so just a reminder what's coming up we've got a couple of more club updates uh this calendar year the next one will be really important for your accredited clubs because we're heading to revalidation so i'd really recommend anyone that's involved in accreditation formerly known as chart standard get that person onto the next call because that's going to be really really important because there is a bit of work to do for a lot of our clubs um also we've got some more coach support workshops which we mentioned earlier there's uh three coming up uh, at thorncliffe the two on there are the ones in september um encourage any of your coaches that want further support to to get down to them they're free of charge and it was mentioned last time that we'd run a neurodiversity awareness training session um we've got a few emails saying we didn't know about it we'd love to have gone there's another one booked in now so I'll share this slide deck with you so you'll have the links to be able to go straight to it. Absolutely superb piece of training, um, suitable for coaches, suitable for parents, suitable for players and suitable for club officials as well to increase your awareness of, of neurodiversity um, and then the implications that behaviours and, and the things we do in and around football, the implications that they can have 
on children or adults uh, that, that have conditions uh, that fit in with that. So really great piece of training. Uh, again, free of charge. And that one's at Thorncliffe as well. Um, I'm just going to pass to Claire. 60 seconds, Max Claire. Go, go, go. <laughs> Safeguarding in Sport Weekend, known as Play Safe. That's the logo there. It's the 17th and 18th of September. You will be sent resources um, by the FA uh, around video, social media, posters, and so on. It is an opportunity to really remind club members about safeguarding standards. Think of be creative, think about how you can get those messages out to parents to, so that they're really thinking about. What should my child be experiencing? What should the safeguarding be like in this club? And uh, and to demonstrate that you are a good safeguarding club to them as well. End of. Well played. Right then. And uh, like I said, we've kept you a little bit longer than than we uh, promised to. So absolutely no problem if people start dropping out of the call right now. We will stay on as usual. We'll try and mop up any questions or anything extra that you'd like to ask. I will send the slide deck out. I'll send any links or any bits and bobs that we refer to tonight in that email. Feel free to come back to us um, over the coming weeks or days if you've got any more needs around this area. But once again, thank you for coming on with us tonight. Um, it's really, really important topic. It's something we're really passionate about. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Like I said, we'll be staying on. So if there's any questions, you can either unmute yourself or pop it in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. There we go. Thank you, Ellis. Thanks, Zoe and Rob, as well. No worries. <laughs>